with that, uh, tonight's message is in Galatians chapter 3. Let me turn this thing on. And so I titled the message The Substitute, and hopefully by the end of the message, maybe we'll kind of figure out why I gave it that title, hopefully. But uh, before we get into tonight's scripture, I kind of wanted to share with you guys um, about the first time in my life that I had a run-in with the law. <laughs> now, keep in mind that I grew up kind of a shy kid. I didn't get in trouble when I was a little kid. That came later. But when I was a kid, and this, I'm talking like the fourth or fifth grade, um, I know it was then because we lived in Anaheim, and back then Anaheim was actually a, a nice place to grow up and live, but uh, I had to walk a few blocks to Orchard Elementary, so I know it was the fourth or fifth grade, but when we'd walk to school and we'd walk back, there was this uh, neighbor down the street who had this big giant plant in his yard, and it was one of those plants with like reeds coming out of it, and it was just... It was huge. In fact, it was so huge that you could literally walk through the middle of it. And so that's what we did when we went to school. We would walk through the middle of it. And it got so, so many kids did this that there was literally a dirt trail going right down the splitting this plant in two. And probably the neighbors weren't too happy with us. And uh, I was kind of a chubby kid. And so whenever we like whenever we'd have physical education PE class and we had to like jog or run or anything like that, I was always that guy huffing and puffing at the back of the line. And uh, so naturally when me and my brother and my friends were walking back and forth to school, everyone would, would run across this plant and I would be the last one in line, and, which is probably why I was the one that got caught doing it. But I remember coming home from school and I was in the house, and there was a knock at the door, and, I, and we answered the door, and the police were at the door. And apparently, they wanted to talk to me about walking across my neighbor's plant. And I don't think they do this today. I don't think, I don't think the police would come to your door for walking through a plant today, but back then, that was something that happened. And uh, that was my first run-in with the law as a child. Um, I'll tell you about the first time I broke God's law, and uh, it was probably about two seconds after I was born. <laughs> I was probably angry at my mom for pushing me out of the womb or something. And, uh, but that's, the Bible says, and yeah, I think you've probably heard it said before, that uh, we, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. And so the Bible tells us that we were born with this sin nature. And so it doesn't, it doesn't take us very long in life uh, before we, are, we sin and we are, we are under this, this law that uh, condemns us if you haven't received Christ as your Savior. Um, but uh, keeping that in mind, let's go through these verses and uh, we'll see what we can learn from uh, Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 19 through 25. And it begins like this. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, then truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we 
might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So the first thing that we should make note of here is that in these verses, Paul kind of goes into this question and answer session. And uh, so his first question is, what purpose does the law serve? And then he says, does the law go against God's purposes? And so he's in this question and he asks a question, a rhetorical question, and then he gives us the answer. And as we've been going through this book of Galatians, we also have been asking questions and then providing the answers. And uh, there's four questions to be exact. And the questions are, what is the point of the passage? What can I praise God for? What can I put into practice? And how can I pray? And uh, right off the bat, I think it's important that we go ahead and answer that first question, right? Because the question is, what is the point of the passage? And we don't want to go through Scripture pointlessly, do we? So I'm going to tell you the point of the passage. And really it answers this first question here, which is... um, What is the question? The question is, let me read it. What purpose then does the law serve? So we want to answer that question right off the bat. And the purpose of the law is to clearly reveal sin and to point us to Jesus. Now... Last week, when we, uh, last week, during that message, we kind of focused on the promises of God, right? Uh, they were promises that God made to Abraham and in, through Abraham to all who would come to believe in Jesus. And there was also the new covenant, which is a bunch of a series of promises that are made to those who would believe in Jesus. And tonight, we want to look at the law of Moses. And what we want to do We're going to look at the law of Moses in order that we can kind of compare and contrast the two of them, okay? And so last Wednesday, we learned that God's promises were, one, unconditional. In other words, they don't depend on anything that we do. And number two, we learned that God's promises are unchanging. His promises are everlasting. They cannot cannot be altered. They cannot be revoked. And number three, we learned that God's promises are undeserved. We're all sinners. We all fall short of God's standard of righteousness. Um, God's law, however, that was given through Moses, we are about to see is very much different than the promises. And... uh, the number one thing that we learned about the law, that we're going to learn about the law of Moses is first that it's conditional. The law of Moses, God's law, is conditional. Why? Because it must be obeyed. God's promises are a series of I wills. I will do this. I will do that. But the law of Moses is a series of you wills. It says throughout, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. And uh, throughout the books of the law, like Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, God basically says, do this and you will live. And here's one example from Leviticus 18.5. It says, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And so basically it's God saying that do this and you shall live. And uh, so God's law is conditional. God's law is also temporary. You see, it's temporary because it only lasts until Jesus' death on the cross. Now, we're going to go back to this subject a little bit later, but it says right here at the end of verse 19, it says it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And so the promise, the seed is Jesus, right? 
And so until Jesus comes, the, the, the law of God is in effect until Jesus. And you really will see that it really ends at the cross. And uh, so the old covenant, it ends at the cross, and that's when the new covenant begins. Uh, last week I read the new covenant. Uh, we, we find it in Jeremiah chapter 31. And what it promises is an intimate relationship with the Lord. It says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then it says, all will know me. And so, under the old covenant, access to God, or the holiest place, was very limited. Uh, the holiest of holies in either the tabernacle or the temple was barred by this thick veil. They say it may have been up to six inches thick. And the high priest could only go in there once a year. And he did not go in there boldly. He went in there very fearfully. But when Jesus died on the cross, we read that that veil was torn in two from top to bottom. And this gives believers access to an intimate relationship with God. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. And the new covenant also promises forgiveness. It says, I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. And we know that Jesus dealt completely with sin and forgiveness on the cross. He, was, he paid the price that we couldn't pay, right? And uh, this brings us to number three, which is that all of the penalties for sin that are in the Old Covenant, and most of them result in death, right? All of those penalties in the Old Covenant are completely deserved, because we are all sinners, and we all fall short. The wages of sin is death, and so the covenant with Moses promised what? It promised death. It says the soul that sins, it shall die. And we're all sinners, right? And so the wages of sin is death. And that's why in Paul, when he's... Uh, writing 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he basically says that the covenant of Moses kills. It is a ministry of death. But we all know that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And so God gave the law. And you know, when God gave the law, he didn't give it reluctantly. He was not a reluctant lawgiver. When God gave the law, he put on a display. He put on a show. And it involved majesty. It involved things like thunder and lightning and earthquakes. There were trumpet blasts. There was darkness. There was a whirlwind. There were blazing flames up on Mount Sinai. It was a huge demonstration of the serious, seriousness of God uh, regarding God's law. And when he did this, he told the people, don't come near. He said, don't touch this mountain or you will die. So it was a very serious thing. God revealed the law of Moses then. And, and the law of Moses is really vast and it's complex, isn't it? There's all kinds of external religious rules. There's ethical, moral rules and laws. There's commandments. There's ceremonial laws. There's sacrificial laws. And feel free to read through the book of Leviticus. If you haven't, I encourage you to. But uh, it, it's, it's a slow read because it's very deep and complex. And if I was to go through that tonight, I'd put you all to sleep. But... <laughs> but uh, we're not going to do that tonight. In fact, Jesus, when he came, he pretty much summed up the whole thing in two statements, right? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, that sums up the entire law. And... Uh, <clears throat> But he went on from there. He didn't, he didn't, when he said that, he didn't let uh, anyone off the hook, right? Because even those two things, none of us can do it. In fact, Jesus would 
go through the law when he taught, like in, on the Sermon on the Mount, he would go through the law and he would say something like, you've heard it's been said, thou shalt not murder, right? But then he would, he would ramp it up. He would say, but whoever is angry with his brother is guilty of murder. And so first these Pharisees, these religious people are hearing, you know, you've heard it been said that thou shalt not murder. And they're like, well, I'm, I'm good because I've never murdered anyone, right? But then he says, anyone who's angry with his brother is guilty of murder. And so he didn't let anybody off the hook with that, right? We're all guilty. And so what Jesus did was he took this external law and he internalized it. He also said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And so they're like, okay, fine. I've never cheated on my wife. And then he says, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so Jesus would just basically lay bare the wicked and deceitful heart of men. He would reveal that God's standard of righteousness no man could be justified under it because all, everyone is guilty. So tonight, we can praise God for this fact. And that is that the law of Moses was never meant to be our means to salvation. Amen? And so this brings us back to tonight's text. And just to kind of fill you in on some of the background details. You've probably heard it before, but maybe you've kind of forgotten a little bit. But wherever the Apostle Paul went, he preached the gospel, right? And there were some Jews who were saved through Paul's preaching, but they were mainly churches that were made up of Gentiles who had no connection to the law of Moses at all. They weren't raised in it. They didn't know about it. All they had heard was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were saved by that gospel and churches were founded. But it wasn't long after that that some Jews from Jerusalem came into Galatia. And they were actually, they were dogging the Apostle Paul. They were following him around wherever he went. And they're the same Jews who would later follow Paul into the temple in Jerusalem just before Paul got arrested, they were yelling this. They said, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. And so what they wanted to do was they wanted to correct the teaching that Paul was giving. And uh, their correction was basically to say that no, salvation is not by faith alone. Salvation is by faith alone. Plus, you need to adhere to the laws and rules of Moses. And that includes circumcision. It includes the other ceremonies and rites and rituals. They were asking believers to admit that they were not genuinely converted. They hadn't really been born again. They hadn't really been saved. They hadn't really been transformed. They weren't really headed to heaven because they hadn't, they hadn't really received the Holy Spirit and they wouldn't receive it until they began to obey the law of Moses. And so that's when Paul writes the Galatians. He writes to them to establish the gospel of grace through faith in Jesus Christ and faith alone. So here in chapter 3, starting in verse 19, Paul is kind of foreseeing some of the questions that these Judaizers might have. And you can, you can almost hear the Judaizers saying, really, Paul, if it is through faith in Christ only that a man is saved, then what is even the point of there being a law? And our first point tonight is what purpose does the law serve? So these false teachers, they held the belief that God granted to Abraham and all the people right up to Moses pure salvation by faith alone because there was no law at that time. However, when the law came, they're saying God's plan changed. And now the law of God, not the promise to Abraham, is the new way of salvation. You have to do it through works. It doesn't eliminate faith, 
It doesn't deny faith. It says that it's faith plus obedience to the law of Moses. And they're basically teaching that it was a necessary condition along with your faith to follow the law of Moses. And so they would ask, you know, if that's not true, then why did God even give the law? And Paul poses the question in verse 19, what purpose then does the law serve? And then he answers it. He says it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And uh, it goes on to say it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. A mediator does not mediate for one only, but God. I'll just briefly tell you what that's basically saying. And it's confirmed in the book of Hebrews that the the, that God's law was first handed down to the angels. The angels handed it down to Moses. Moses handed it down to the people. Um, but on the other hand, Abraham's law, or the promises to Abraham, God made those promises directly to Abraham. And so that's really all that last part is saying. Um, but the first part here, the law was added because of transgressions. And so the purpose of the law is to reveal sin clearly. And it's not only to reveal sin, but it's also to reveal our guilt. And then it, the purpose is to drive people to God in repentance, to cry out in faith our need for His grace. And so the law was given to make the sinner know just how sinful he was. And... Paul shares more details on this in the book of Romans. If you go through them, it says in Romans 3.20, it says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And then Romans 4.15 says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. And then in Romans 7.7, 7, it says, I would not have known sin except through the law. And so God's law was established so that we would recognize the fact that we are sinners, and that we need a Savior. And if it says where there is no law, there is no transgression. You know, that's the reason why, why we have so many laws in America, is because if they leave something out, then you can't be arrested for it. And so they need to make it an extensive and complete thing. And so God does the same thing when he goes through four, four books that are all dry reading on different laws, this and that, morality and ceremonies and rituals and circumcision and Sabbath days and all those different things. But uh, the purpose of the law is to expose sin. And it was added to make sin a legal offense. And that legal offense demands a penalty. Because up until that point, there really was no clear definition of sin. One of the reasons that people were so wicked in the days of Noah was because they didn't have a clear definition of sin. And the law was also given to separate Israel from the nations around them. They had dietary laws. They had cooking laws. They had clothing laws. They had Sabbath laws. They had all these rules laid out in the Old Testament. And the purpose was to isolate them from the nations around them because there was paganism all around them. They were literally a tiny island in a sea of pagans. And so God wanted to preserve them. He wanted to protect them so that they could be a witness to him, the one true God. And so he insulates them by giving them laws that made it very difficult for them to interact with other people. And that was kind of God's protection for them. But that all ended when Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And that's kind of the dividing line between the law and the promises that are in the new covenant. Romans 10.4 tells us this. It says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So God's law went from being written on stone tablets to being written on our hearts and our minds. And that way, all would know him and our sins would be forgiven. The reason Jesus said that you don't put new wine into old wineskins is because you don't add the works of the law to salvation by faith. Um, I read this quote by a guy named Andrew Jukes. 
Not sure who he is, but what he said sounded great. He said, Satan would have us prove ourselves holy by the law, which God only gave to prove that we are sinners. So what purpose does the law serve then? Now that Christ has come, there are no more ceremonies. There are no more rituals. There are no more Sabbath laws. There are no more dietary laws. There are no more clothing laws. There is no more Levitical priesthood. There is a new covenant. There is a new kingdom. And there is a new priesthood. And David even foretold that eternal priesthood in Psalm 110 verse 4 when he said, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And we went through that. Remember when in the book of Hebrews, we went through chapter 7 and it taught us all about Melchiz the order of Melchizedek. Um, it, it talks about how the Levitical priesthood, which ministered to the people in an earthly tabernacle or an earthly temple, was no longer in effect. We now have this new priesthood that is in the eternal priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, and the high priest of that priesthood is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he's not ministering in an earthly tabernacle. He's ministering in the heavenly one. He is he is at the right hand of God interceding and ministering on our behalf. And that's far better, far better, a much better priesthood. <clears throat> so question, what if anything remains of the law? Well, there's one huge part of the law that remains, and it's the moral law. And the moral law is really a reflection of God's character. So it's a reflection of the character of God. And now, as a believer, all that's left for me is the moral law. And what should my relationship be to that? The answer is simple. And I'll pose it in the form of the question. Are there any commandments to believers in the New Testament? Are there? The answer is yes. Are there any commandments... Are there any commandments in the New Testament about what you should do and about what you should not do? Are they there? The New Testament is filled with them. And so God does want you to obey Him. God does want you to keep His commandments. And so what is the Christian believer's relationship to the law now? It's instruction to holiness is what it is. And so, what can I put into practice here is this. <clears throat> Find the balance between grace and obedience because both of them are true. And let me explain that a little bit because the truth is, is if I oppose grace like the Judaizers do in Galatians, then I'm damned to the system of works that doesn't save anyone. But if I oppose obedience, then I will never grow. I will always be stuck in my ma Christian maturity right where I am. Um, Peter talked about it. or Well, actually, it's in the Old Testament. God says, be holy for I am holy, right? And then Peter repeats it in 1 Peter. He says, God says, be holy for I am holy. And uh, so what does that mean? It means that, uh, you know, grace is when we get saved, Jesus gives us his righteousness so that when God the Father looks down on us, he doesn't see our filthy rags, but he sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. That's how we can have a relationship with God. And so his righteousness is a picture of pure grace, right? But then we have self-righteousness, which the Pharisees had, and that was thinking that they were righteous under their own, because of their own good deeds, their own good works. But there's another kind of righteousness that's personal righteousness. 
And this is the one really what it's talking about when God says, be holy for I am holy because the God's law is a reflection of his character and we want our character to reflect God's character, right? And so as we walk through this Christian life, there's something in the word is called sanctification, but it's basically steadily growing and growing and growing in, in righteousness, which means to, like when I first became a Christian, I didn't have much integrity. I wasn't an honest person. I did all kinds of things that went against God's law. But as I, as I grow in my Christian faith, I gain, I'm more honest than I was before I became a Christian. I have more integrity than I did before I became a Christian. And so I should be growing in these things. I should be reflecting the character of God in my walk and I should be becoming more Christ-like as time goes by. And so there's this balance. Find the balance between grace and and obedience, because both of those are true. And uh, this brings up the other question for the evening, which is this. And it says it in uh, verse 21. It says, Is the law against the promises? And uh, so while that first question was the hypothetical question, which said, what purpose does the law serve? And then he answers the question. So this, the first one was a hypothetical question that Paul could kind of foresee that the Judaizers might have asked. And this is a question that Paul is directly asking them and then answering himself. So it's kind of like Paul is saying here, you asked me a question, now let me ask you a question. Even though Paul is the one asking, asking both of the questions and answering both of the questions, he kind of poses it like that. You ask me a question, now let me ask you a question. Is the law against the promises of God? Because that's really what these guys are doing here. They're trying to enforce the law, but they end up contradicting each other. And so Paul answers, certainly not. Certainly not. The law is not against the promises. They actually complement each other. Before I got saved, I hit rock bottom, right? And I think a lot of us came to that same place before we got saved. Amen? I hit rock bottom, and God uses the law to do the same thing. Because before he can really make things better, he has to make things worse. I think you find that's true in trials too, right? Before things get better, things get worse. And so that's kind of what the law does. It makes things worse so that he can make things better. The law exposes sin. The law provokes you to sin. The law condemns that same sin. It provokes you to sin because... I don't know if you've ever come across a sign that said no trespassing, but what's the first thing you think is, gee, I wonder what's on the other side of that, right? And so the law provokes us to sin, and it condemns that sin. It basically kind of takes the lid off so that you can really see for yourself who you are underneath. We are sinful, we are rebellious, we are guilty, and when we're under the law, we are in chains to our sin, and we are helpless to save ourselves. Verse 24 says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And then it says, After faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And so the law is kind of like a temporary tutor, uh, it's to bring us from the place of trying to earn our salvation to the place of placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And so the law is like a substitute teacher. Now, I'm not talking about that overly polite teacher who basically you mocked and got away with murder from. Not that substitute teacher, but it was the really mean one it was the one who didn't let you get away with anything. 
the one that you were afraid of, and the one you were so glad when your regular teacher returned, right? I, uh, in my study time this week, I came across a, some words, and they're, they're written by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but I kind of wanted to share them with you. And he says this about the law. He says, it is only when one submits to the law that one can speak of grace. He says, I don't think it is Christian to want to get to the New Testament too soon and too directly. He says, we must never bypass the law and come straight to the gospel because to do so is to contradict the plan of God in biblical history. Then he says, is this not why the gospel is unappreciated today? It says, some ignore it, others ridicule it. And so in our modern evangelism, he says, we cast our pearls and the costliest pearl being the gospel, we cast them before swine. And people cannot see the beauty of the pearl because they really have no conception of the filth of the pigsty. No man has ever appreciated the gospel until the law has first revealed him to himself. And it is only against the inky blackness of the night sky that the stars begin to appear. And it is only against the dark background of sin and judgment that the gospel shines forth. Not until the law has bruised and smitten us will we admit our need for the gospel to bind our wounds. Not until the law has arrested and imprisoned us will we pine for Christ to set us free. Not until the law has condemned and killed us will we call upon Christ for justification and life. Not until the law has driven us to despair of ourselves will we ever believe in Jesus. And not until the law has humbled us, even to hell, will we turn to the gospel to raise us to heaven. And so the gospel tells us that everybody sins. It tells us that everyone breaks the law. Every human being who's ever lived except for Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are all under God's judgment. We're all cursed by God. We're all on our way to an eternal hell. God, however, is not only a judge, but he is also full of grace. And he is willing to forgive, and he is in fact eager to forgive your sins. And so we are told that we can escape the consequences of our sin by putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because he took our place on the cross. He bore our punishment, the punishment that we should have received. That is the gospel. And those who believe in Christ have their sins covered because Christ paid in full the penalty for their sins to the extent that the justice of God was satisfied. So as we close, we got one last question, and that is, how can I pray? And so, pray that I would obey you, not because I'm afraid of you, not because I'm trying to earn anything, but because I love you. <laughs>